Well, that's our testimony. Aren't you grateful for those of you who know the Lord Jesus? That is your testimony. That is our testimony, and thanks be to God. Our text this morning is from Romans chapter 5, and we'll start reading at verse 6. And uh, you just heard the greatest word that's uh, ever been uttered contained in that music, not just that song, but the fact that uh, God's only Son was given to die for us, that we might know God and be forgiven and that we may have eternal life in him. Isn't it a beautiful day? I tell you, I have the privilege of driving a few miles to get here, and it's just spectacular today. If you haven't been out, uh, I think most of you probably have. But it's just so, so beautiful. And even with all the beauty, uh, we got to witness uh, one of the most amazing and wonderful things that ever takes place when somebody gives public testimony uh, through their baptism. And uh, where is Chance? He's still getting there. Bless you. I'll tell you what, what a wonderful thing. This is a precious, wonderful young man. And uh, Chance, God has really blessed you to help you to know deeply his love. And it was beautiful to see your grandfather uh, be able to baptize you. Chuck was crying in the, in the baptistry. I'm going to start now. But anyway, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. And Chance, we're so thankful for God's hand upon your life. And you're always going to belong to him. You always will. And he is in charge of the outcomes of your life. And that doesn't mean life's going to be perfect for you. Uh, it's not perfect for us in this life. We live in a fallen, fractured, broken world. But God is in charge of our outcomes. He's got us in his hands. And chance, God bless you, that you belong to him. 
and thank you for sharing such a beautiful testimony through your baptism. You'll never forget that your granddaddy baptized you, and uh, and uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Isaac Watts, the great old hymn writer, wrote the words that I reflect on often. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gains I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. The magnificence of God in the work that he did through that execution of that man that should have been forgotten to history on a Roman cross was God's greatest gift to us as he gave up his son to die willingly for our sins that he could take all of our sins upon himself and die to the power of sin, that we might be forgiven and be raised from the dead, that he might enter into our life and into our world and into our walking and into all that happens for us and be alive in and through us. And through that cross and resurrection, give us redemption, rescue us from the destiny of being controlled and determined by the forces and the powers at work in this world, that God may take charge of our life and our outcomes, and that he might forgive us and bless us. The scriptures reveal something of an understanding. It's, it really is, folks. I, I have spent a good bit of my lifetime pondering as best I can. You know, any human being is very limited in comparison to God, but as best I can to read the scriptures and as they say to think the thoughts of God after God, the scriptures allow us to think along with God and to think God's thoughts after God. It's the ones that he's revealed to us and it's still too much, but yet even so, uh, God has given us the capacity to have a, a simple significant, rich understanding of what he has really done for us through Jesus Christ. Let's read Romans 5, verses 6 6 through 11. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult or praise in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now, that's a lot of significant words and concepts. We're going to ponder together a few of them today, but let's not forget that these rich, significant interpretations are talking about one very real event, that Jesus, a man, who was very God and very man, a miracle that's hard to comprehend, but God's only son lived a sinless life, was condemned to die, and was nailed to a cross and died for our sins, taking our sins upon himself, pouring out his blood that provides a cleansing of all of our sins. And after three days rose again, and walked among his disciples and ascended to live at the right hand of God and someday, one day, will appear and call his people to join him. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful outcome, chance, all of us, our outcome that we have because we have trusted in what God has done on that cross? If I had been there as a follower of Christ, I hope that I might have been among those that went to observe. It would have been excruciating. I've watched a lot of people die. I've never observed an execution. That one would have been almost too much to take. I don't know what I would have comprehended 
Mark's gospel is the best at telling us that the disciples struggle to understand who Jesus was and what this was about. But I hope I at least could have said with, with the centurion, truly, this was the Son of God. And I hope I could have felt whatever I understood that the one being crucified was the only hope I had to belong to God. Because that's what the cross means for those of us who come to it and know Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul explains some aspects of the cross to us that will help us as we ponder, as we enter what worldwide is a very holy season. Daryl and I talked some time back about focusing this Sunday and next Sunday, which will be Palm Sunday for Christians around the world, and focusing on the cross. And then, of course, two weeks from today. Do you know what two weeks from today is? It's Easter Sunday. And as we move toward the resurrection and the power and the wonder of celebrating the resurrection of Christ, before we do, let's visit again, as we always should, the cross of Christ. And why? Why? did Jesus die? We understand it in simple ways. Have we taken it in deeply? Well, in this particular section of verses, group of verses, the Apostle Paul uses four words that are understandable, and they're a window into God's perspective on the state of our lives. And you see the title of the message, The Cross Tells Us Who We Really Are, and it really does. David Brooks, the New York Times columnist that some of you may like and some of you may not, I find him fascinating. He was recently in the region, and I got a chance to hear him uh, personally. And I got his book last year, his most uh, recent book, The Road to Character, and read it be uh, mainly because I'd heard of the stories of some really famous, significant people who have lived lives of character, and it's a, it's a fascinating read. In fact, David Brooks has confessed in the midst of his journey uh, to try to write that book uh, that he is going through a transformation of some kind and he won't publicly say what it is. But uh, I heard him say with his own words that he wrote the book to save his soul. I don't think he's found it yet. <laughs> and uh, maybe one of these days he'll find the Lord Jesus Christ. But something significant has happened to him uh, as he has sought to understand uh, who God is and what it's about. But he talks in that book about resume virtues and eulogy virtues. <laughs> resume virtues are those things that we'd like for people to know about us, the things that we think would commend us for jobs and uh, for opportunities to do things in our life. The eulogy virtues are those things that are going to be said about us at our funeral. And they might be quite different. They usually are. And, you know, we would all like for good things to be said. You know, I've heard some really interesting funeral messages. Uh, as a West Texan, I, I kind of like some of the old, crusty, raw West Texas preachers. I actually heard a preacher one day do a funeral for a scoundrel. And bless, bless the old boy's heart, he just was. And people loved him, his family loved him, and preacher said, you know, we all loved old, I forget what his name was, he said, you know, he really tried, he, re he really, really did, and we really loved him, but he said, and this was the best thing he could say about him, he said, you know, he could have been worse. <laughs> that was really the essence of the funeral, the eulogy virtue of old so-and-so was, well, he could have been worse, and so could all of us. You know, really, if somebody stands at my funeral and says that he was a wretched sinner saved by the grace of God because of the cross of Jesus Christ, that's enough. It really is. Now, would I in my selfish moments hope they'd say a little bit more? Well, sure. <laughs> Maybe even he could have been worse, but anyway. <laughs> but Paul tells us, under inspiration of God, who we really are. Helpless sinners, enemies of God, ungodly people. Now that's who we are at our worst. And in this life, even with the power of God at work within us, we do have our worst selves. And thanks be to God who is at work in those of us who know him 
we're becoming more like him in our best moments and in our best days. But we really are. Helpless, in fact, we are. I cannot get myself right to present myself to God. I can clean up physically, dress up with whatever the best I have, but I cannot get my life and my character good enough and right enough to stand before, before a holy God and commend myself to him. I am helpless in that regard. I cannot cleanse myself of my sins. I've been through periods of life in which I was racked and deeply disturbed by my own sinfulness. And, uh, and you know, I really could have been worse. I'm not, I don't know that you'd have thought all the things that I've done were all that bad. I don't know. But I tell you what, they deeply disturbed me. And, you know, I've cried as many crocodile tears as anybody before God. I've actually done that. I realized in the midst of them that I was kind of trying to work up emotion before God. And I thought, you know, this must look ridiculous. But I've also had that throbbing, deep sense that there's nothing I could do to cleanse myself of my sins. And only Jesus. And only the cross of Christ. Jesus taking my sins upon himself and his blood purifying me and cleansing me of all unrighteousness would enable me to stand before God. I'm helpless without the cross of Christ. And so are you. I can't even get to God until I come to the cross of Christ who is my mediator, my Savior, the one who died for me, the one who made peace between me and God. And that is the only way I can come to God. And when the Apostle Paul says, for a while we were still helpless, that word literally means weak. So weakened we could not do for ourselves what only God could do at the right time. Christ died. While we were still in the state of ongoing sin, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still in the state of sinning, while we are still in the state of sinning, Christ died for us. <laughs> Folks, I, you know, I, uh, one of the aspects of theology that fascinates me and troubles me is that. Uh, I have, of course, been drawn to an understanding of God, but also to a richer understanding of this human struggle. They call that in theology, it will be no surprise, anthropology, the study of the human condition, the study of the human spiritual condition. And the Bible explains it all. I mean, no theologian that I have ever found gets beyond just the basic descriptions of Scripture very far. Uh, they, In fact, they can't. If they do, they're wrong. Uh we're fallen people, and we lapse. We just lapse. We find ourselves, because of God, those of us who know the Lord, and for those of you who do not know the Lord, please know that I say this with humility and grace. There's no, I'm no better than anyone, and only because of God's work and God's grace is there any transformative work going on within me or anybody else. But even so, in my sinfulness, I lapse. I digress. I wonder. Let me, let me use a trivial illustration. I'm not going to get overly confessional. By the way, I'm not doing a lot of bad stuff out there. I said, my wife says, you need to, you're a lot better than you sound. I said, oh, you just don't know. But anyway, <laughs> occasionally, I cannot resist. This isn't going to surprise you because of the way I look. Occasionally, I cannot resist a donut. <laughs> Was that an amen? <laughs> you know, I can go six months. I think I've, I think in the last decade, I may have gone a year. That's about as long as I've ever gone without a donut, but I, I can go a while without a donut. And then there's that day. In fact, it's happened a couple of times when I've been driving to Taylor's Valley Baptist Church. There's that. 
There's that day. You look up and there's a picture of a donut. And I just find my arms, just my hands turning. To, what am I doing? What in the, wait a minute, what am I doing? And just pull right into that donut line. And there I sit with all those other sinners right there in the donut. <laughs> Lined up, testifying to our sinfulness. It gets worse. I don't ever order just one. Now that may sound very trivial. But folks, that's in microcosm. Our natural state. Because in bigger ways, more significant ways, more devastating ways, more helpful ways, we lapse, we digress. We wonder, and there is a control and power over us, and because of our humanity, we wonder. We're still driven by selfishness and passions out of control, emotions that make us say and do things that we really don't want to say and do. And even by God's grace and God's power at work within us, there is the greatest war in this world and in our life is that war within us that which would take us away from what we might be, the better transformed person that God wants to make in us. And while we are sin, while we were, and while people are still in a state of sinning, Christ died. It's impossible to correct that. Only Christ can intervene and break, as the song says, the power of, of canceled sin. But Jesus died for helpless sinners like you and me, taking those sins upon himself and by the power of the cross, breaking the power of sin in our life that we may trust him and live for him and his power at work in us can enable us to live for him. He's taken all of our sins. He does take them. He will take. There are two other words, and I'm going to, touch on these quickly. Ungodly, that means unlike God. In fact, very unlike God. You know, God always sees the worst in us. And still, he loves us and gives his son for us. That other word you may struggle with a bit, enemies. That's people who oppose God. I tell you what, we don't give enough credit to the power of evil in the evil one and the forces at work that would turn us against God. There's so much deception. I don't know if or when, if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters or the last time you may have, but there's no description I know of that shows the subtle ways that the evil one will turn us to things that are lesser than, other than ways we need to be living. Are we enemies of the plans of God? Now, if I had to stand up and vote, I wouldn't vote against God. I wouldn't stand up and say anything against God. I don't stand here today as somebody who says that I'm opposing or I'm against God, but there is something in my nature that can oppose a plan of God. Just by standing apart and being silent. There are things that God wants to do in your life, God's plan for your life, and all you have to do is sit there in your easy chair at home and really subtly and quietly in a very sweet voice say, Lord, I'm not sure I can do that. Now, that sounds like self-doubt. I'll tell you what. First of all, it's a bald-faced lie because you're saying to God, no, God, I'm not going to do that. Do we oppose the plans of God? Do we oppose the work of God when God wants to do thing, something in our life or in our midst, when God wants to do a work through the Taylor's Valley Baptist Church? Can we be in opposition of that just by passive non-support? Now, I'm not saying people shouldn't have a right to discern what God 
wants them to say or do, and we don't always see eye to eye. And, you know, we Baptists are known for our difference of opinion, and the reason we are is that we do it so publicly. We were like hierarchical denominations. They fight it out behind closed doors, and we just bring it into the business meeting. And so everybody sees it, but nevertheless, we can't oppose the work of God. We can't oppose the ways of God by our actions. I am reflecting more on how we are passive-aggressive opponents to God, <laughs> smiling, singing praises, acting sweet, and doing nothing to follow and respond and live what God wants us to live out in our life. Why Jesus died on the cross is to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. In our weakness, in our sinning nature, in our ungodliness, in our resistance, Jesus died. And God looks upon us as we come before the cross of Christ, confessing our sins as one completely forgiven and cleansed and unburdened of that sin. It's amazing to me that the Lord Jesus can do that and purify our minds and hearts. The text says in verse 6, at the right time. I'm not going to spend much time on this today, but I want to speak to it. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That warrants another sermon. You've heard them. We've studied it. But I need to say this. When Jesus died, when the impact of his death began to hit the cultures, surrounding cultures in which he lived, the whole world has to take notice of the fact that the, the calendar by which humankind is operating particularly in the Western world, was recalibrated. It was before Christ. It was Anno Domini. It was after Christ. And the way that we order our calendared world was shifted because one man died and was executed on a Roman cross. The cultures of the world were dramatically shifted within generations. The Roman culture became transformed in many of its places because of the power of the cross of Christ. Christianity spread like wildfire across the world and hearts were transformed and people are changed. And even today, there is an outpouring of the Spirit of God and the preaching of the gospel unlike that we have seen, particularly in South America and Africa and parts of Asia. We don't hear enough about it because we live in a Western world where institutional Christianity is in decline. But I'll tell you what, the world changed when Jesus died. And it came at the right time, and the ongoing effect continues with power. But what changed? From the moment Jesus died, even while he was on the cross, allegiances and hearts changed. A Roman centurion stood and looked at this executed prisoner and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The effect was immediate and powerful. Three of the words that Paul uses in this passage that we read are significant to understand what changes in us. First of all, we became rescued people. That's what the word for saved and being saved and salvation means. It means rescued and snatched, snatched out of helplessness and weakness. I'll tell you what, folks. I think there are things I might have been I know there are, had it not been for Christ, but I would be nothing of anything that God has been able to do, whatever that is, in a limited way, except for God's work in my life. I am a rescued person. Uh, folks, I, I told you before, I went through a neuromuscular disease when I was 27. It left me with paralysis in my legs and feet. I, don't, I hardly ever think about that, but God spared me for that. But I tell you what, that is nothing compared to to God's salvation in Christ that redeemed me from a helpless, weak person destined for an eternity apart from God, rescued me and brought me to the cross of Christ that I could be forgiven and changed and that God could begin to do a work in my life that I might live for him and live forever with him.
was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone I've been set free my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me here below, will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are forever mine. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Cook. What a great word, a great reminder. The cross tells us we're some things, but Jesus tells us we're the opposite of those things, and that's the good news, and we can know that. It's been good to be in God's house today, to worship Him, to praise His name together. So bless you this week as you go. Don't forget, we'll be back in here at 5.30 tonight. I need to say that the children's worship hour, is that the right word for that? is not meeting tonight, um, but the nursery will be open. So um, Brother Givens will be uh, continuing his study at 5.30, so I hope you'll be here. I think there's a deacon's meeting today, business meeting Wednesday, choir Wednesday, and we'll just kind of plod along. You'll be in prayer for our pastor search committee as they're uh, deep in their work, and uh, uh, keep praying for them. Uh, many of you um, heard about uh, Paige and Francie Hill. They're not with us today. Paige and Francie were in an auto accident Friday afternoon. Paige is in the hospital. Um, they're they're okay could have been a whole lot worse um, but uh, Paige has got a fractured uh, hip so it's gonna be a little s slow healing for him so may not see Paige for a while but uh, so be in prayer for them I see Dana Coleman's gonna have some surgery this week be in prayer for him and uh, Ross Barnes had some surgery Friday so be in prayer for him lots lots going on if you're not plugged into our uh, virtual prayer room log into that and you can see lots of things to pray for in uh, among our church family so uh, keep our keep our church members in prayer as we go forward. Well, let's join hands across the aisle, and we're going to just uh, sing that uh, chorus again. That's such a great word. My chains are gone. Amen? Here we go. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending love. Amazing grace. God bless you as you go today. Greet somebody.